On today's news, some interesting stats showing a severe lack of interest from fans in this year's Survivor Series. Keith Lee has a new look, my review of SmackDown, Tempest review of Rampage, and more. Yes, I'm completely fine after losing the championship at Survivor Series after 154 days. Why do you ask? I'm totally fine. I'm fine. Don't worry, guys. I'm fine. So fine, in fact, that I think that you should press the subscribe button and enable notifications so that you can see in future videos just how fine I am. Subscribe. Support WrestleTalk. Survivor Series was this past Sunday, where not only was Luca Coward, who jammed in his jam in the jar after losing the predictions legitimately and underhandedly making his way to the championship win, I'm fine, but it was also one of the big four WWE pay-per-views, supposedly. Though, realistically, the most interesting thing to happen on the show was Vince McMahon's golden egg, which really says a lot. And that storyline was anticlimactically concluded on Raw, so we don't even have that going for us anymore. But as it was reported in the lead-up to Survivor Series, it wasn't really WWE's intent to make Survivor Series feel important, as they had other things to worry about, like Crown Jewel, The Draft, and releasing a bunch of wrestlers on two separate occasions in November. Must take a lot of mental energy. And this was reflected in the fans interest in the show too as in the latest wrestling observer newsletter it was pointed out that survivor series did around 200,000 google searches which is a level you'd expect for a b show not one of the big four for added context all out in september did around 500,000 google searches though to be fair to wwe with the average age of a wwe viewer being around 102 i don't think they know what a google is this doesn't exactly bode well for wwe heading into december a month well renowned for being a bit of a down period period in WWE, amplified this year since there is no December pay-per-view either, with the company instead opting to put on day one on January 1st. But you know what isn't a failure? Keith Lee. He's awesome. We love Keith. And just when you thought that Keith Lee couldn't get any more handsome, here he is on Twitter showing off the fact that from 16 he started to get white hairs in his beard, and now at the age of 37, look at that magnificence! Or, in other words, bask in its glory. Is there anything Keith can't do? How do you screw up Keith Lee? Also, watch Adam's fantasy booking of Keith Lee on Parts of Unknown that went up yesterday. It's really not hard to not screw it up. It's been widely reported that Johnny Gargano's contract is set to expire within the coming weeks after he signed a one-week extension to compete at War Games. But the same is not true for his wife and former NXT Women's Tag Team Champion Candice LeRae. Dave Meltzer has reported in the Wrestling Observer newsletter that LeRae's deal with WWE is set to expire in May of 2020. 2022. However, it is noted that the belief is that additional time will be added onto the end of the contract because of her pregnancy. Larray announced her pregnancy earlier this year and has obviously not wrestled since, but has continued to appear on NXT in skits alongside Gargano, Indy Harwell, and Dexter Loomis. It doesn't appear that Larray will need to make a decision about her wrestling future in the near future. However, it will be interesting to see what role, if any, Gargano's looming contract decision will have on her choice to stay in WWE or test the waters elsewhere. Larray has been with WWE since making her debut at NXT TakeOver Philadelphia in 2018, and has competed in NXT ever since, having great matches with Io Shirai and being part of the way with Gargano, Hartwell, and Austin Theory. Now before we get into my review of SmackDown, here's a quick word from our sponsor. Before we get on with the rest of the news, I'd just like to say a big thank you to this episode's sponsor, Surfshark VPN, which you can get 83% off and four months free if you go to surfshark.deals forward slash wrestle talk and you Use the code WrestleTalk. Surfshark VPN lets you trick your device into thinking it's in another country, which doesn't just make your browsing much safer, it also gives you access to the content libraries from places like the UK, the US, or Japan, which will have movies and series that aren't available in your region. I'm talking streaming services like Netflix, Amazon, BBC iPlayer, and yes, the WWE Network. That's right, if you're in the US and you want to go back to the old WWE WWE Network, with all its original content and far superior search and chapter functions, then install Surfshark VPN now to get access to it from outside America. And do so using our links in the video description below. Surfshark.deals forward slash wrestle talk, or you'll get 83% off and four months free if you use the code wrestle talk. Surfshark have been one of our biggest supporters this last year, so we'd really appreciate if you at least check them out using the link below. Support wrestle talk and support your internet privacy with Surfshark. And now it's time for my review of Smackdown, 
in about five minutes. You know, I mentioned most weeks how Roman's entrance is really long and the first few minutes of SmackDown every week are essentially meaningless before anything of substance actually happens. Well, this week they decided to take it one step further, as they initially announced it's going to be a Black Friday Invitational Battle Royal for the number one contendership to Roman Reigns' Universal title. That's good. That's meaningful. Kayla Braxton is in the ring and says that rumors have been heating up about Brock Lesnar. Boom! Here's Roman's music, a really long entrance, a long recap of the Biggie and Reigns match from Survivor Series, and before Paul Heyman starts talking in the ring and anything of actual substance begins on the show, six and a half minutes have already passed. Six and a half minutes of just... nothing. Reigns says he's good and everyone else is a loser. Heyman says that the Lesnar thing being unsuspended is just a rumor. That was essentially the entirety of the promo, and wouldn't you know it, now we're 15 minutes into the show and nothing has happened yet. We then got Jeff Hardy and Drew McIntyre versus Happy Corbin and Mad Cat Moss, and Drew and Hardy won after a Claymore and Swanton onto Mad Cat Moss. Kayla Braxton again is backstage, and Paul Heyman says if she can't get a confirmation or denial about the Brock Lesnar being unsuspended rumors by the end of the night, then she's gone somehow. Cesaro versus Ridge Holland came next, Ridge with his main roster debut, and he got 99% of the offense in this match and then Cesaro rolled him up. I don't mind Ridge losing, but you have to make him look good in defeat, and in WWE's mind, giving him all of the offense for a couple of minutes makes him look good, but in this case, it didn't. If he'd have had a competitive match with Cesaro for like 15 minutes and then only just lost after several near falls, that probably would have made him look much better than dominating for two minutes and losing via roll-up. Rick Boogs and Angel competed in a Thanksgiving leftovers throwdown next. What's a Thanksgiving leftovers throwdown? I hear you ask. And it's just a, a match with some Thanksgiving stuff on some tables outside the ring. Umberto calls the distraction, playing Boogs' guitar. Nakamura kicked his legs out from under him, so he fell through the table he was standing on, but Angel hit the wing clipper on Boogs, for the win. Adam Pearce backstage had a flashback of Brock Lesnar getting suspended. No, no, seriously, they didn't look to a TV monitor or throw to a recap. He just had a flashback of it backstage that we could also see, and then said he'd be shocked if the suspension was lifted anytime soon. Mm-hmm. And then, oh God, and then Charlotte Flair did a promo saying Becky had to cheat to win, which she did, and then out came Tony Storm. You know, the Tony Storm who last week said Charlotte would come for her after she lost to Becky, and Charlotte herself then confirmed that by acknowledging her and saying she was coming for her after Becky. So Charlotte here said she didn't know who Tony was, hit her in the face with a pie, walked off a bit, walked back, hit her in the face with another pie, and then walked off again, or Tony Storm just stood there and did nothing. All right. 30 second rant, here we go. 30 seconds, starting now. What is your problem, WWE? Why do you keep booking Charlotte Flair like this? This has been the same feud that Charlotte's been in for, since like 2016, where she has to mock and ridicule her opponents and then she's gonna win. Tony Storm looked like the dumbest of dumb baby faces. She literally just took a pie in the face and was just like, oh no, I'm a bit sad. And then Charlotte just walked up to her and hit her in the face with another one. Why are you defending yourself, Tony? Why do you have to book him like this? Charlotte Flair looks dumb. Tony Storm looks dumb. I don't care about the 30 seconds. Go away. I don't care. I'm going past the 30 seconds. I'm breaking the fourth wall. That's not the term. I'm too amped up about this right now. What is your problem, WWE? Why can't you make Tony Storm look good? She's going to be challenging... Sh <coughs> I'm getting caught in my own words. Just make her look good. She's going to be challenging Charlotte for the title. Why can't you just have her look like a dominant challenger or like an actual threat to Charlotte that she takes seriously? But instead, there was some Thanksgiving stuff on the table, so she just slapped her in the face with a pie. And it's like... Tony got the better of her and threw her out the ring, so Charlotte was immediately on her feet going, yeah, come on, it's like, T Tony just got the upper hand on you, like, treat her like a threat. Oh my god, I don't blame Charlotte for this, I blame her booking and the character that WWE have given her because she's just so dominant all the time and she can't take any of her, her challenges like an actual threat and she just, just slapped her in the face with a pie and Tony was like, oh, I got hit in the face with a pie. And then Charlotte walked off like, oh yeah, I'm the greatest, and then walked back again next to the table and was like, oh yeah, Tony, come here. And then Tony just walked up to her and Charlotte just hit her in the face with another pie. Like, I can't describe how really stupid Tony looked. Go and watch the segment yourself because she looked like an absolute moron. They just walked up to Charlotte like, oh, you want me to come? I'll come over there. Why? Just hit her. Do something, Tony. You just got hit in the face with a pie. Oh my god! This was infuriating.
Sasha Banks and Naomi face Shayna and Natalia next, and after the initial half of this match seemed very off in terms of pacing, with a lot of them waiting around for each other's spots to finish, it picked up towards the end with Naomi not even needing to tag in Banks and rolling up Natty for the win. Then we have the Black Friday Invitational Battle Royal, which featured Jeff Hardy, Ricochet, Sheamus, Rich Holland, Rick Boogs, Happy Corbin, Madcap Moss, Mansoor, Cesaro, Sami Zayn, Eric, Ivar, Jinder Mahal, Shanky, Drew Gulak, Mace, Angel, and Umberto. And crucially, not Drew McIntyre, or King Woods. You know, the two people that would be the most likely to win. Drew was annoyed he wasn't in the match, so he came up before the match started and literally tried to kill everyone with a sword. So everyone got out the ring, understandably. Adam Pearce came out to quell Drew. Ooh, I wonder what's gonna happen. Is Drew gonna get included in the match? Is he gonna slice Adam Pearce with a sword? Will there be some other consequence? No, it's time for an ad break and then Afterwards, it's just the Battle Royal without Drew, and we're told on commentary, Drew made his own way to the back during the ad break. Because why show anything interesting on TV, right? The Battle Royal itself was a Battle Royal. There was nothing special. The final four were Ricochet, Jeff Hardy, Sheamus, and Happy Corbin, and Ricochet was eliminated by Sheamus. Corbin and Sheamus imploded, which allowed Hardy to win. But swerve! Sami Zayn had gone out through the middle rope earlier in the match and he came back in and eliminated Jeff Hardy. Sami Zayn wins! I legitimately forgot about Zayn being in the match so this was a nice swerve. But his celebration was cut short as Caleb Braxton then announced breaking news! Brock Lesnar's suspension has been lifted and he's back on Smackdown next week. So it'll be Sami versus Brock versus Roman, right? And Sami's eating the pin? Yeah? And that was the show. Let me know what you thought of it by voting on our poll on a poll match on our community tab, where 56% of you voted for Sami Zayn actually won something. This was mostly a nothing show, really. Not much happened. Sami Zayn won a thing, which is nice, but him being immediately overshadowed by Lesnar, I think is emblematic of how this story will pan out. I have no idea why Drew wouldn't have been included in the Battle Royal. It doesn't make any sense. Ridge lost his debut match, and Tony Storm looked like an absolute moron. This week's show is a 2 out of 5. And now, over the Tempest for his review of AEW Rampage. Genuinely, if AEW put out a Rampage shirt that said wrestling's palate cleanser, I think I would buy it. So what's going on Russell Talk friends and fans? Tempest is back with another review of AEW Rampage in about three minutes. So this show opened up with a tag team match pitting Adam Cole and Bobby Fish against Orange Cassidy and Wheeler Yuta. Now personally, I was a big fan of this match. I think it's much more palatable to watch Orange Cassidy's more gimmicky style when it's in a tag match like this, where you still get someone like Wheeler Yuta to carry the bulk of the load of the actual wrestling in the match. We got a lot of funny comedy spots from Orange Cassidy, but we did get a taste of an Orange Cassidy Adam Cole match that we hopefully will be getting in the near future. Ultimately, Bobby Fish was able to get the win over Wheeler Yuta after after hitting a big Falcon Arrow off the top rope. And I think it's really good that they're able to get him some big wins after coming off a series of big losses. Once again, Rampage starts off with a fantastic match. I'm giving this a four out of five. We got the announcement that Tony Nese will be going one-on-one -on -one with Sammy Guevara next week before getting the Black Friday deal match pitting Riho against Britt Baker. It's really nice to see Riho get spotlighted in a big match like this. It's been a little while. She's been put on the back burner in recent months. Really since she lost the title to Nyla Rose last year, she hasn't done that much of intrigue, but getting a big win over Britt Baker in a match like this is a big step in the right direction. I don't think she's going to win the title back by any means, but it's nice to see her in the mix. This match was also really solid. Riho hit a big cross body off of the top rope to the floor. That was really cool and got the win with a really nice cradle, hooking both legs and getting the pin. They're still very clearly teasing dissension between Britt Baker and Jamie Hayter, and that is another match that I'm very much looking forward to seeing. This whole segment was very good. I'm giving it another 4 out of 5. We also got the announcement that FTR will be taking on the Lucha Brothers in a 2 out of three falls match and if the revival slash FTR have proven anything it's that they're very good in two out of three falls matches color me excited and we got the main event as Eddie Kingston took on Daniel Garcia once again I thought the order of matches on this show was really strange I could have sworn that this match would have taken place in the middle of the show with the women's match going on last but it's not my company. This match was pretty good. Daniel Garcia is excellent, as we all know at this point, and he was able to get Eddie Kingston in and out of a number of different leg submissions before Eddie Kingston was able to win with a double spinning back fist. Of the matches on this show, this was probably the one that I cared the least about, and it seemed like it was the one that the crowd cared the least about as well. It was just an odd choice to close out the show, as Chris Jericho came down to fend off a beatdown from 2.0. Not, not that 2.0, the good 2.0. But overall, the main event was pretty good. It was my least favorite thing on the show, but 
but not bad by any means. I'll give it a three out of five. So on the whole, this was another very solid episode of Rampage, but also one that was fairly missable as it felt like the only thing on the show that had real consequences was the women's match. And I think the show would have really benefited from having that go on last. It was not a bad show by any means, and I will give it a four out of five, but I wish there was a little bit more oomph to this show. And that just about wraps it up for me. If you want to hear more of my thoughts on this week's Rampage and last night's SmackDown, I was not a fan, I'll tell you that much. You can go over to Wrestle Talk Podcast later on today where myself and Chopper Pete will be going over both shows in complete detail. I miss my crown. Have a good weekend, y'all. How do you screw up Keith Lee? He is history's most perfect man, you stupid f***ing bastards. What do you want from your professional wrestling main eventer? The guy has to be able to talk. Okay, how about a charismatic love child of Barry White and the world's sexiest bear whispering inspirational poetry at you with a kind of eloquent baritone that gives you vibrations in your bone marrow and can make you feel like the only person in the room at a crowded cocktail party.